Maple Street. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I guess these pictures were kind of small. So we have a Sandhill Crane, a uh, Short-Eared Owl, a Townsend Solitaire, Prithonotary Warbler, and Dick Sissel. And uh, all of the photos of birds anyway in this presentation were actually from 2017 while I did my big year. Uh, so this is the table of contents I was mentioning. We have a red crossbill on the top right and a, an eastern screech owl on the bottom right. I'm not going to go through this list because I'll be covering it in the presentation. So who am I? Uh, I'm Jeremy M. Bensett. Uh, the M is important, so you don't mistake me for the non-birder Jeremy Bensett who lives on the other side of my county. Uh, so I'm, uh, I like to think I'm pretty passionate about uh, birds and wildlife. Uh, I grew up in Leamington, which is within the Point Pelee birding circle. Uh, it's where I've lived pretty much my entire life. And I visited Point Pelee regularly uh, growing up, but I had no idea that bird watching was even a hobby when I was a kid. Uh, and I only got interested in wildlife about uh, 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. Uh, so in the bottom left, that's a photo of my dad holding me as a baby at the tip of Point Pelee. Uh, if you see, there's a little, uh, a little uh, shape in front of the trees on the right side of that photo, that was actually a person with a tripod. So maybe that was the first birder I ever crossed paths with. Uh, and the bottom right is a photo of my brother and I at the Point Peely Boardwalk. My main hobby before wildlife was video games. I guess that's not so unusual, but to be so into nature now maybe is a bit of an anomaly. Uh, I have a psychology degree from the University of Windsor. Uh, the bottom right photo is my grad photo. Um, and uh, along the lines of that photo, some might say that I am free-spirited. Uh, the bottom left is the photo of a downy woodpecker on my shoulder after a pretty bad windstorm. It actually climbed up my pant leg and up my shirt and went on my shoulder before flying to a tree. Uh, some other interests of mine uh, post video games are insects like moths, butterflies, dragonflies, uh, bees, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, I, in previous years, I've raised insects in captivity. Uh, so on the bottom right, you can see a box that I designed for housing a small number of monarchs. Uh, the bottom left is a photo of my insect sheet and insect light at night. I, I'm also into mammals, reptiles and amphibians, uh, wildflowers and a little bit of native gardening. Uh, so the bottom center photo is a lesser fringe, less purple lesser fringed orchid. Some combination of those four words. Uh, <laughs> And uh, that was from Rainy River during my big year, actually. That's probably the most beautiful flower in Ontario, in my opinion. Uh, some other interests, tour guiding, uh, educating people about wildlife, wildlife photography, kayak paddling. Um, I've practiced a little bit since the photo of my red kayak in the reeds there, uh, and generally conservation. And uh, the little monster in the bottom right corner of this photo is a short-tailed weasel from Northern Ontario. So preparation for my big year. I tentatively planned on uh, doing a big year since 2012, which was around the time when I started my birding. Uh, so my birding from then until the start of my big year focused on understanding how a big year works. I didn't do a big year every year. By no means did I do that. I, I just really learned where and when I should expect anything and everything that might cross paths uh, with an Ontario birder. Uh, and uh, I learned a lot about rarity finding. 
Um, and then uh, the chart in the bottom part of the screen here. Uh, so kind of off the top of my head before my big year started, I, I divided Ontario's total list of 493 at the time into five tiers, depending on how common or rare they were. Uh, so tier one would be like the absolute givens. Uh, like there was never a reason to go out of my way to chase any of those 175 species in the province. I knew that I would catch up with them as I traveled around. Uh, tier two were the little bit trickier, but still very reliable Ontario species. Uh, tier three, well, so the photo on the right on the bottom is a house sparrow. It's kind of like the, the leader of the tier one species. Uh, tier three, like the prairie warbler on the left, uh, are the trickier birds that are still guaranteed if you know where and when to look for them. Uh, tier four would be the rarities that are pretty much annual, but more or less expected. And the tier five, which is a pretty big list, are the bird species that had been seen in Ontario in history, but either a very, very small number per year or less than one a year. Uh, so tier one and tier five contain the vast majority of uh, the total list. It was important to try to get all tier one through three, more or less all tier four and as many tier five as possible uh, in order to do the best that I could. Uh, so some other things for preparation. Uh, I had sponsorship with Vortex Canada. Uh, so uh, I guess recently the, the name of the program has changed to ambassadors, but uh, uh, it was the Vortex uh, Field Pro Staff uh, team at the time. And that helped a lot with uh, birding gear, like optics, uh, some clothing, things like that. Uh, and I had a work contract for the year with Bird Studies Canada, which is now called Birds Canada. Uh, so the bottom left photo was the, I believe that was the 2017 team, uh, minus Tim Arthur. No, sorry, that was the year before his team, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, Doug Tozer, uh, who's the, the lead scientist for that project, is uh, crouching down in front of the three of us there. Uh, that year, I recruited my friend Tim Arthur, who is standing next to me uh, on the right picture, uh, to work with me doing the Bird Studies Canada work. This was imperative because although we have a flexible schedule based on weather and our own timing, uh, it's a little tricky to get a random coworker to be willing to drive on an 18 hour detour while on a work trip. Uh, so Tim was up for that challenge. Another uh, big point in preparation was I told everyone that I was planning to do a big year uh, for a whole year actually before the year started. Uh, so I figured this would build a lot of momentum and it would mean that I wouldn't be able to change my mind and cancel that plan uh, before or during that year because it would be too embarrassing after telling everybody. Uh, my goal was to do the best that I could regardless of aiming to break the current record. Uh, this was really important because I think it's too easy to get pretty high strung about having a really ambitious goal. Uh, you know, if one feels like, uh, you know, you're falling too short of the goal at the moment or, uh, you know, something's not going exactly the way that you want. There's a lot less disappointment involved when you don't have an extremely ambitious goal other than just to do your best. Um, and uh, a good example of this is the Google Maps image in the bottom of the slide. So you can see that's a route uh, from Leamington, my hometown, to Thunder Bay. So that's 18 hours. That was in late April. Uh, 
Tim and I actually made that trip trying to see a tricolored heron, which is a, a southern United States and tropics bird. Uh, we drove the 18 hours. Once we were at Lake Superior, we encountered Thunder Bay District's worst ice storm in like 25 years or something. Uh, and uh, there were like trucks all, like all over, knocked off the road and it was just crazy. Like there were tree branches falling because they were so heavy with ice. We had this little, uh, I can't remember the car now, but it was a little sporty rental car with summer wheels because it was late April in Southern Ontario. It was a pretty crazy drive. Uh, we missed the tricolored heron, drove about two hours back, got to a roadblock where a truck was laying down across the road and found out that someone saw the tricolored heron that we couldn't find. So we drove back the other direction, missed it again because it flew away after someone else saw it. Uh, and we spent a whole 24 hour uh, stretch there looking for it and drove all the way back home only to find out that people saw it again the following day. Uh, so you can only be so disappointed when, you know, when, uh, when your goal isn't to necessarily break the record. Uh, so more preparation. Um, this didn't go uh, as planned. But Alan Wormington, who was uh, basically my birding coach in the years leading up to doing my big year, uh, probably Ontario's top birder ever historically. Um, it's hard to explain how good of a birder Alan was other than that even I will probably never reach Alan's status. Uh, he passed away in 2016 in the fall, just before the big year that I was planning started. Uh, he was going to be one of the main people who I would be uh, phoning on my trips to, you know, try to make decisions and uh, figure out important information and things like that. Um, instead of getting bummed out, I let this uh, sort of light a fire to. Uh, to push me to try even harder in Alan's memory. So the photo on the left is Alan and I in Texas, uh, goofing off. Not too many birders saw Alan goof off like that. Um, he was fairly serious around most people. And uh, the photo on the right was a big group of Alan's loved ones, uh, the vast majority bird watchers from Ontario, uh, that was kind of our version of a funeral for Alan. Uh, so big year record history in Ontario. So Alan, who I showed in the last slide, had Ontario's first real big year record uh, in 1981. So this is not only before cell phones, but this is before email. Um, he ended up with 320 species in 1981. Uh, he didn't plan to do a big year. He just had an incredible year of birding, probably traveled quite a bit and probably chased some rarities as well. Uh, it wasn't until 1996 that Glenn Cody set out to do a real serious big year in Ontario. He smashed Allen's record, um, but you know, understandably seeing as uh, it was the first real planned one. Uh, he had 338. So that's still before uh, at least, you know, relatively functional cell phones. Uh, and then it wasn't until 2012 that Josh Vandermeulen beat Glenn Cody's record by five with 343 species. So this was the record that I was sort of chasing in uh, 2017. So let's start with some missed bird species from, uh, from my big year. So these were uh, pretty much the tier four birds, the ones that I figured were almost guaranteed with enough effort and some luck, uh, but they don't all work out. So uh, I missed in 2017, Jeer Falcon, 
which is that large Arctic falcon on the bottom right photo, laughing gull uh, from uh, south of us, purple sandpiper, uh, the shorebirds in the bottom left photo, and yellow rail, which breed pretty extensively through the boreal forest, um, but uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're easy to catch up with. Some other likely species that I missed, these were rarer, but still almost annual for me uh, in this area or somewhere in Ontario, uh, Mississippi kite. So that's the bird of prey in flight on the right hand photo. Uh, Point Peely is probably by far the best place in Ontario to see the rare Mississippi kite. Uh, Swainson's hawk. Every year there are at least a few seen by hawk watches, uh, but very easy to miss if you don't spend a lot of days hawk watching. Yellow-throated warbler, which is the small songbird in the bottom photo. Uh, and willow ptarmigan. That's uh, a small chicken-like bird of the uh, tundra habitat. They breed in far northern Ontario and they come down a little bit, but not quite to car accessible locations. But in 2017, one did. So Willow Ptarmigan uh, was found at a park in Toronto in spring 2017. It was a pretty big fluke find. Uh, by Toronto local Noam Marcus. Uh, that day I was doing uh, a birdathon uh, after raising money for the birdathon uh, for Birds Canada at Point Pelee. And my team and I decided that we wouldn't chase the willow ptarmigan and I could go see it in the north later. It ended up being very difficult and I didn't want to spend a few thousand dollars for a northern trip just to see willow ptarmigan. So, it is what it is, but it hurt to see those amazing photos of it. <laughs> uh, so some other missed rarities, ivory gull, that's like almost a mythical bird to see in Ontario and most places in the world. Rock wren, uh, there was one in uh, Bruce Peninsula, uh, only for one day though. A lot of people tried the following day. Lark bunting, uh, that's a photo that I have there in the center of the slide from Texas. Gray kingbird uh, was found at the tip of Long Point, but that's a very difficult to access spot. Uh, that's the, the bird in the bottom right photo. Cast and sparrow also found at the tip of Long Point. Tropical kingbird, uh, that was one day in northern Ontario. and. Uh, as, the, as is the case with most uh, kingbirds and flycatchers that are mega rarities, it was not there the next morning. Uh, and white wagtail and Costa's hummingbird. Those two were new species for Ontario's list and that's why I put stars next to their names. Uh, they were unfortunately just not accessible or not heard about until uh, after they were uh, no longer uh, in the place they were found. So highlights. Um, I'm just going to have a, a small selection of highlights from my big year because there were way too many to list all of them. Uh, so species number 18 for the year, which was January 1st, was Smith's Longspur. Uh, this was in uh, uh, Norfolk County, close to Long Point. This is one of the high Arctic breeders that is on the northern coast of Ontario in the summer, but to access where they breed is a pretty crazy uh, uh, trip to go on. Uh, so now January 2nd, we're on species numbers 38 and 40, uh, black-headed gull, which is the left half of the photos in the slide and slaty-backed gull, which are the right half of the photos in the slide. Uh, so the really nice picture of the black-headed gull with the actual black hood, uh, that was one that I actually ended up finding in the summertime 
uh, locally here in Leamington area. Uh, but the small photo of the one in flight was the one that I saw on January 2nd at Niagara Falls. Uh, Slady-backed gull, not great photos. Uh, the photo of it sitting on the ground or on water there was across the Niagara River on the top of the Niagara Falls. Unfortunately, that meant I was looking at it while it was in the United States, so it didn't count for an Ontario list. Uh, but that flight photo locks it in as an Ontario listable bird uh, when it flew over Ontario's control gates. Uh, so now we go to January 4th. The number is already racking up a bit. We're at 66 northern sawwet owl uh, and 67 boreal owl. So those two were both in the same location in Ottawa. I was there uh, specifically looking for this boreal owl. And in the process, I looked through a few cedar trees and I found a sawwet owl. So that was kind of a nice treat on top of actually seeing the boreal owl I was dreaming of finding. Uh, now we go to almost mid-February, February 10th, uh, great gray owl. So driving through Thunder Bay district, uh, I was uh, I was on my way to see a great gray owl, um, maybe an hour away from Thunder Bay city itself. And on the way out of the city, I found three within about 300 meters right along the highway. So that was a pretty cool highlight. Uh, then I found a fourth one, uh, I think it was two days later, February 12th, uh, the same day that I saw this Northern Hawk Owl. Uh, so a friend of mine told me that uh, if I drove through Northern Ontario in the middle of winter, I was more likely to see a Northern Hawk Owl than a crow. And that was correct. On that drive, I saw three hawk owls and zero crows. So now we go to mid-March, March 18th. Uh, we're at number 141 already. So that goes to Brambling. Brambling is a finch from Europe. And uh, this was at a private resident feeder in Brockville. Uh, far eastern Ontario and uh, unfortunately this one was only uh, an opportunity for a very small number of birders to see because it was in a gated community and it was like a single car width laneway um, because friends knew that I was doing this big year uh, the opportunity came up for me to be one of those few birders to see this brambling. And that day we saw another uh, great gray owl. I think that was the seventh great gray owl I saw for the year. So now we're on to mid-April at 180 species. So these are black-necked stilts. Uh, they're a prairie breeding uh, shorebird, quite a large shorebird actually. And uh, I guess they've become kind of annual in Hillman Marsh and surrounding area in the years since 2017. But at this time, I'm pretty sure this was like the 11th or 12th record ever for Ontario, uh, found by a friend of mine in Windsor. Uh, so this trip, produced some pretty colorful and unusual birds. Uh, so number 229 was a painted bunting in a small town in Lennox and Addington County, which is close to Kingston. Uh, a white-faced ibis in Muskoka District and a western tanager in Kawartha Lakes District. Uh, so, so we're at 231 on May 2nd and 3rd. So the pace has been pretty quick up to the beginning of May. 
now we move to mid June. So that was 231, beginning of May. Six weeks later, already 301. So, uh, so that goes to Viol Violet Green Swallow. Uh, that's a very Western species of swallow. And uh, I think it was only Ontario's second record at the time. It was uh, found in Thunder Bay trying to hybrid nest with a male tree swallow, of all things. So uh, they didn't nest successfully, unfortunately. But uh, uh, my close friend, Josh, Josh Vandermeulen, who I mentioned, who currently held the big year record at the time, uh, he was willing to help me fly with him to Thunder Bay uh, with his a uh, large pile of aeroplan points and I was very grateful for that that was the only flight that I took in the entire year uh, the rest of it was driving um, but yeah so in 24 hours Josh and I left Toronto got amazing good looks at this violet green swallow uh, and flew back to Thunder Bay we actually didn't even have a ride when we got there I sent an email to the Thunder the the Northern Ontario bird alert asking if anyone happened to be driving past the airport and wanted to help us out a little bit so uh, we made a few new friends in thunder bay district that day uh now uh june 25th we're at number 305 this was a pretty colorful one too and uh fairly tropical this is a scissor-tailed flycatcher so this was found in mississauga i uh, it was, uh, as you can see in the right photo, it was actively hunting over a grassy field. It was pretty amazing to watch. They, uh, they fly with their tail fanned almost like legs and they move their tail back and forth, almost like they're walking over the, just the top edge of the grass. Uh, that was a lot of fun to see. Number 306 on June 29th is Magnificent Frigate Bird. This was a pretty exciting one, especially because it was in my hometown of Leamington. Uh, it was actually uh, just across the creek from uh, Peely Wings Nature Store, which is a place that I currently work uh, through the winter at and uh, do some of my tour guiding through. And I had worked there uh, a few years before my big year as well. So that was a pretty nice one. That's a really large bird if you've never seen one and from the south too. So this was a pretty exciting highlight, tricolored heron. Uh, if you remember, I had a similar map photo like this early on in the presentation and a story about none other than a tricolored heron. Uh, another one fortunately came up in Toronto on July 22nd. The only, actually, I well, I guess it was probably the day before, but uh, the problem was Tim and I were currently even further than the previous map showed. We were in Rainy River, which is about as far as you can drive in Ontario from southwestern Ontario. Uh, so that was a 23 hour straight drive all the way back. Uh, I guess the map I have shows back to home. It would have been maybe three hours less than that, probably about 20 hour drive. Uh, so we drove overnight all the way back home after three short nights in Rainy River, camping on a rock on the side of the road. And uh, and when we drove to Rainy River, we, we drove overnight as well. So it was a pretty exhausting trip. Adrenaline was keeping us well awake. And we got to Tommy Thompson Park walked the like five kilometers in extremely hot summer weather on top of it and saw the tricolored heron really well. This was probably the most exciting bird of my whole big year, um, largely because it was at my home park, Point Pelee. Uh, this was a wood stork and it was only Ontario's fourth ever, if I remember correctly. Uh, so. As with some other stories here, 
Uh, I was in Algonquin Park at the time, camping with Tim because it seemed like mid-August was an okay time to spend a few days uh, camping for fun. Of course, someone finds a wood stork like half an hour away from where I would have been at home. Uh, yeah, so uh, I drove back from Algonquin Park. Tim was kind enough to offer to take down my tent for me if I just left it there and went straight home. And uh, I missed the wood stork by about 10 minutes. I was about halfway through Point Peely when a friend of mine told me that it flew away and it was not seen again that night. I even tried with a spotlight well after dark and came up empty handed. I went back out first thing the next morning and several friends from as far as Toronto had already come and left and I didn't see the wood stork. And then someone walked by me on the trail and asked if I saw the giant white bird standing right next to the trail. And it was a spot that I walked by twice. So I guess it flew in and decided it was going to hang out there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that was really exciting. Uh, wood stork is a species that's had pretty significant decline even in their native range. And it's a very large and unusual looking bird. Uh, so now September 24th. This slide I called a risky highlight chase uh, because so in the morning that day, someone found a fork-tailed flycatcher at none other than uh, Tommy Thompson Park, the, the place that requires a four or five kilometer walk to get to. Uh, but when I was about to leave, someone else found a Eurasian collared dove at Rondo Provincial Park. Normally, I wouldn't think twice about bothering going to see a Eurasian collared dove uh, away from home uh, because they're becoming somewhat regular in Ontario. I've found them several times right at home here in Leamington area. Uh, but because it was a big year, I had to risk a two or three hour detour from seeing the four-tailed flycatcher and go look for the Eurasian collared dove first. Luckily, it was a pretty easy chase and continued on my way and got great looks at both birds. I, I think the fork-tailed flycatcher was only like the 10th or so record ever for Ontario at the time. And so that is now 325 and 326 on September 24th. So that number is getting pretty high, but it's getting a little bit late in the year. So the record tying bird. Uh, this was in Waterloo. So we're moving forward now. That was uh, late September. We're now on November 19th. Uh, the record was 343. So this mountain bluebird, which is from Western North America, was found at a place called Snyder's Flats in Waterloo, which I guess is relatively close to Guelph. Uh, that was a pretty cool one. And it was nice that uh, Josh and a couple of other close friends, uh, Josh was the current record holder at the time, uh, they met me there and we all saw this mountain bluebird together when I tied the record. The record breaking bird was the very next day, November 20th. Uh, this was a Northern Gannet in Hamilton. So a Northern Gannet is an Atlantic uh, ocean bird. Uh, sorry for the terribly poor quality photo in the top right corner there, but that was the best that I could do. Uh, while it sat on the water several hundreds of meters away from shore, uh, that one seemed like it was gonna be a uh, potential miss because when people first found it it was flying around but it must have known that I really wanted to see it because it landed on the water and a friend stayed there with his scope and uh, made it really easy for Tim and I to show up and see it. Uh, that was a pretty cool one. Um, also just because uh, Josh who is on the left side of that photo there, uh, he met Tim and I at that spot uh, for that highlight of me breaking his record. Um, 
and uh, Tim is the person on the right in the photo, and another close friend, Sarah Lamond, uh, who actually she went to University of Guelph. Uh, she was also there at that time. Uh, yeah, so now pretty special sighting that year. This is number 345, so two after the gannet, uh, a barn owl. So this is, uh, by a lot of birders' standards, kind of a dream bird for Ontario. Uh, the odd one comes up here and there, and sometimes certain birders get to see it. This one was actually right in my home county. Uh, and a friend of a friend happened upon this barn owl in their barn. Uh, it just so happened that they made conversation with this acquaintance who is a close friend of mine about the barn owl. And through that, uh, maybe a week later, uh, they gave me a phone call because the barn owl was hanging out in their barn again. So, uh, yeah, so that was the day before my birthday. That was a pretty nice birthday gift. Uh, yeah, pretty uh, neat looking bird and got to share that with a few close local friends. And finally, the last species added to my big year list. A tufted duck. So this was in Oakville, uh, December 16th. So this is now seven days after the 345. Uh, new year birds are pretty slim pickings at this point in the year. Um, but yeah, so this tufted duck that is normally a European species and in small numbers on our Atlantic coast annually. Uh, this was a pretty big highlight, and still to this day, it's the only one I've seen in Ontario. So uh, now some uh, statistics and conclusion of my big year. Uh, so the final count, like I said in the previous slide, was 346 bird species uh, in the province. I broke Ontario's record, which was held by Josh, who is standing next to me in that photo there. Uh, by three and uh, I definitely feel like luck played a huge role in uh, my success in my big year but I'm also a strong advocate that we make our own luck I uh, you know like with a lot of things uh, being out and birding a ton and knowing what you're looking at and what you're looking for uh, are pretty big factors in seeing a lot of pretty awesome birds the same can be applied to a lot of things in life, of course. Uh, so I traveled about 102,000 kilometers by car. Uh, that was uh, 86,000 just in my Ford Escape, uh, aside from rental vehicles. Uh, that's the same as driving from Halifax to Vancouver 17 times, or the circumference of the earth about two and a half times. I, I like to think driving around in Ontario is probably more exciting than driving across the oceans two and a half times. Uh, so uh, some environmental uh, implications uh, with doing a big year in such a broad area. Uh, you know, I, I'd be lying if I tried to say that driving that much in a year is environmentally friendly because it's not. I, I definitely don't have plans of repeating something like this. Um, I do think that there were some pretty big positives uh, conservation wise though, from doing something like this. Uh, it exposed a lot of people to birding or uh, inspired a lot of birders to uh, get more into it uh, and generally nature uh, appreciating it. Uh, which also, of course, leads people to things like uh, conservation. Um, it made quite a few news stories. Uh, so I think there were a lot of people who had no idea about bird watching, like I did as a kid, uh, who maybe took a little bit of interest just because they came across a story about bird watching being a thing at all. Uh, 
And also the work that I do is pretty much entirely conservation based. Uh, so uh, there were uh, some pretty big uh, powers helping me uh, with uh, support for my big year. Uh, Ontario's birding community as a whole, of course, is uh, very much up there in the, the main uh, groups that I'm thankful for. Uh, clubs like yours, Essex County Field Naturalists, Holiday Beach Migration Observatory, uh, the Ontario Field Ornithologists, uh, many clubs across Ontario that support birding and conservation. Uh, I don't think Ontario's birding community would be nearly where it is if it wasn't for great communities uh, within the broad birding community. Um, Vortex Canada, like I mentioned before, uh, with sponsorship. Uh, actually, there's a, a photo of uh, some locals to Guelph there. Uh, Ken McRory on the left, uh, who's Vortex's general manager and Paul Grant on the right, who is uh, one of Vortex Canada's owners. Um, those guys have been great to me uh, for quite a few years now. Uh, I'm pretty thankful to eBird, uh, made by Cornell Lab. Hopefully many of you know about eBird. Uh, it's uh, a really great way to learn a lot more about birds and to keep track of your own bird lists. Uh, my unconditionally supportive friends and family. I have many friends and my entire family who are not interested in bird watching themselves. And uh, it's great that they're as supportive as they are of my insane obsession with birding anyway. Uh, so uh, some things that have been gained and learned. Um, I think uh, the majority of it has little to do with birds and more about life, uh, lifestyle. Uh, I think uh, this really solidifies that we live in a really great birding community here in Ontario. Um, I proved to myself that I'm capable of anything that I really uh, set my mind to. Um, hopefully, this is inspiring to others too, uh, not necessarily you know, on quite such a large and potentially dangerous level, like doing a big year across all of Ontario, but, you know, I, I, any goal. I, I gained and strengthened countless friendships uh, with many birders across the province. Um, I definitely completed the goal of doing my best and breaking the provincial bird uh, big year record was a pretty great extra too. Um, I really feel like I found myself in 2017. I was pretty into birds for several years before that, but uh, I think that really set it in stone. Uh, it gave the extra push that maybe I needed to uh, make sure that this was going to be my life. Uh, and uh, that's a photo of me on my Ford Escape that unfortunately is now decommissioned because of everything that it's been through. Uh, I was looking at geese in a field in Ottawa. Um, it now sits in the Bird Vehicle uh, Big Year Hall of Fame, my driveway, and keeps my firewood for me. I... I uh, figuratively found my spirit animal, and that is bird. I, uh, you know, in the most general and specific way possible. I, uh, I just love them all. I spend hours a day, still now, four plus years later, uh, looking at birds. Uh, so what comes next? I. Uh, a career in tour guiding, uh, biology and ecology work, conservation, uh, and uh, culture, uh, trying to inspire people. Um, it's gone so far uh, quite well. Uh, like I said, four years later. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, I, I'm still working for Birds Canada, uh, still enjoying it all. Uh, so we have a sharp shinned hawk on the bottom left photo uh, and a blue jay on the bottom right photo. Those are both uh, pretty regular fall migrants along the Great Lakes. And, oh, I guess I had a photo of Tim in here. Anyway, I don't know where it went, but uh, Tim also had an amazing year. Um, that's too bad. It was a really goofy photo. I don't know what happened to it. But uh, yeah, Tim, I think at the time he ended up with Ontario's fifth best figure uh, ever. And uh, he still works with me today. Uh, we'll be doing, I think it's our fifth or sixth fieldwork season together this uh, coming spring and summer season. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Tim took this photo on the last day of the year after unsuccessfully trying one more time for Jeer Falcon and Purple Sandpiper. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully it was entertaining enough. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all out on the trails at Point Pelee and the rest of Ontario. Great, awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, <clears throat> Very interesting. Uh, I'll just I'll share first some of the congratulations in the chat. So, uh, you know, we've had uh, a few people in here saying, um, uh, "Good for you, Jeremy. Thanks for sharing your bird, your heart for birding, and you're very inspiring. And congratulations on your big year and uh, how big of an accomplishment that was. Um, and I have to say that is, you know, just I." Can imagine the amount of time that you spent in your in, in that Fortis Agape. <laughs> so it probably felt like a dear friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'll ever find a vehicle as good as that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's a few questions that have come up into the chat. So uh, one here is, how do you go about determining which birds or species you get, uh, and is there a criteria? So I'm wondering if that's, you know, as you're planning it out in terms of uh, where you're going to be, what? Yeah, so uh, uh, similar to uh, kind of, I guess, along the lines of the chart that I had uh, near the beginning of the presentation, putting all of Ontario's list into five different tiers. I, I also, I guess, uh, partially just because it became a lifestyle over the years leading up to it, but I, I think I did have it down uh, in a file as well to keep track of uh, every, every species that I needed for each season before they weren't going to be so available anymore. Um, with that said, anything, uh, anything that was pretty rare always, always took priority over the lesser rarity. Uh, if there were two real big rarities, it was just whichever I could get to first, and hopefully I could get to the second one in the same daylight. Yeah, another question here. So were any of the birds lifers? Yes. Uh, I wish I knew off the top of my head. I, I'm sure I did for a couple of years, but I want to say, I mean, I, I did do quite a bit of traveling into uh, uh, the state of Texas and uh, Southern Florida before doing my big year. But uh, I think 46 or so were new for my Ontario list at the time or 40 maybe. Um, and probably 15 to 20 were lifers altogether. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and uh, another question in here as well too. Uh, so you mentioned you were in Rainy River in July. What were your target birds for this trip? Were you birding on holidays? Uh, can you comment on finding birds? Your first, okay. We'll start first with the Rady River. There's four questions in here. <laughs> so uh, what what were your target birds for your trip up to Rady River? 
Yes, so Rainy River, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is kind of Ontario's window into the prairies. Uh, so uh, species like uh, Western Meadowlark, Lacan Sparrow, um, Sedge Wren, uh, Upland Sandpiper, Sharp-tailed Grouse, uh, they are the regular birds that you see in Rainy River District. Uh, Black-billed Magpie, Franklin's Gull, um, whereas more or less all of those are fairly significant or unheard of rarities uh, down here in far southern Ontario. Uh, yeah, so Ontario is so big geographically that driving that far northwest, you end up in a whole new uh, like habitat set. And uh, yeah, kind of like that big crazy pink flower um, there's just some things that don't really occur uh, in the, the eastern half of Ontario. Yeah, I'm always amazed by the, <clears throat> you know, if you look at Ontario and I think, uh, I can't remember what it was, oh, I was comparing uh, driving out to PEI, which I have family out that way, to driving up north. And I was like, oh, it's the same distance, if not further, to go to wherever you're going in northern Ontario from where I'm located. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, a drive to, uh, I think a drive to either Thunder Bay or Rainy River is the same as getting to northern Florida, even. Yeah. So that puts it into perspective a little bit for those who have gone on more reasonable vacations. <laughs> uh, so, um, I guess were you, were you birding on holidays? I'm not sure uh, what you mean by that one, Dean. Um, yeah, I guess Dean's there. Yeah, I, I was just, you know, to, to make the big year, did that mean sacrificing holidays with family, so to speak? Oh, I thought God. that might be what you were uh, getting at there. Um, yeah, so that was a big part of uh, of my feeling grateful to my non-birding family. Um, for the most part, they were completely okay and not pressuring uh, to be around for any big events and holidays and things like that. Uh, I think for the most part, it worked out okay. I can't remember which ones it didn't. There were certainly a couple that I was far, far away from home for, uh, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think everyone in the family just thought it was really cool that I was doing this crazy year-long journey, even if they couldn't relate in the bird watching side of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so can you comment on finding birds, uh, you know, by ear versus sight? Uh, so how many birds would, would have made your list only through song? Yes, so... Uh, that's an interesting question because you might think it's relatively uh, high, the number of birds that were on the list by herd only. But uh, as far as I can remember, I think only one was that way. And it was Chuck Will's Widow, uh, which if you're not familiar with uh, the big rarities in Ontario, Chalkwill's widow is like a southern counterpart counterpart to our eastern whippoorwill, uh, so it's a really weird nocturnal, uh, I don't know, kind of like lump of wood looking bird. Um, and uh, the reason why the Chalkwill's widow was heard only, well, partly because they're very very small number. Uh, per year, sometimes not even one per year in Ontario, but the only Chuckwell's widow in the province was holding a territory uh, well off of a road uh, in Prince Edward County. And I think it's actually held that territory for a few years, maybe even still to now, uh, through the summer anyway. But uh, yeah, so that was like a few hundred meters away from the road uh, it would have been a major trespassing situation if someone even tried to go see it. And uh, it has such a distinctive call that you can't 
possibly mistake it for anything if you relatively know bird calls. Um, yeah, on any quiet night, uh, the sound travels so far that uh, it's easy to hear from even a few hundred meters away like that. But yeah, I think that's about it for uh, for what I heard only. Uh, maybe barred owl too. Although I've seen many barred owls, I, I think it worked out that I only heard barred owls, which are about as easy to identify as Chuck Will's widow by sound. Uh, and then on the other hand, it's always handy to know as many calls of the birds as you can, uh, especially if you're birding relatively competitively. Uh, you know, like just trying to see and identify everything that's around you. Um, you can find rarities a lot easier if you're familiar with the calls of all the common birds and then especially all the rarities on top of it. Uh, even if you want to get a look at a rarity, you're more likely to be the one to find it if you know the calls well. Yeah, <clears throat> so I guess one question that I have uh, is, uh, I guess, what, what have you done in terms of preparation for the big year for, um, you know, you mentioned kind of knowing, knowing the calls and all of that piece, like, you know, gearing up for January 1st, uh, what was kind of like your, either your, I guess on both sides, like both your equipment prep and then also like maybe mental prep for starting the big year. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I guess to, to prepare, for identifying the birds, uh, like knowing the sounds and things like that. I'm not great at learning them from recordings. So with that said, anyone who wants some inspiration, don't feel bad if you feel that way about trying to learn the bird songs and calls by recordings. It's really, really difficult. Uh, I immersed myself so much into bird watching. Um, like it was my only hobby for five years leading up to uh, that time, aside from other wildlife stuff, which put me next to birds anyway. Uh, so if you can spend a chunk of time every day listening to the birds that are around you, even if it's in your yard, you don't have to travel very far. Like some people are really into trying to have like the highest year list within an hour drive from home every year. Um, but if you're still learning, you'll probably learn the fastest if you stick close to home and just try to get good birding in as often as you can, you'll learn all the calls uh, within a few years. Um, you know, at least the ones that are local. And then uh, equipment wise, uh, well, uh, once I was uh, representing Vortex, I definitely had better quality optics than I did before that. Uh, so that was a big help. Uh, binoculars always come first and scope second, although a spotting scope is a pretty important tool for birding too, uh, for like lake watching and shorebirds and things like that. Uh, and uh, in my case, uh, I invested in a fairly expensive SLR camera pretty early in my birding, uh, but not to be a photographer. That was more like my insurance on proof of rarities that I found and getting good photos always came second. Uh, yeah, so I guess another, uh, another tip for those trying to get better at birding in uh, as efficient of a way as possible, uh, try to put your camera down for like a year or so and only use binoculars for birding. Uh, even if it means taking field notes and trying to sketch things, even if you feel like your art is just garbage, uh, you know, it'll, it'll represent what you were thinking at the time anyway. And that's how you really sink it into your head. Uh, when you're looking through a camera too much at wildlife that you're trying to learn about, you're too focused on the photos and not enough on, uh, on observing. Yeah, thanks. Those are those are some really great tips. So 
we're uh, we are pushing up to the 8:30 mark here. So um, I'm going to say thank you, Miigwech, um, which is thank you in a Ojibwe, uh, for sharing your story with you and that and that or with us tonight because I think um, that's really what it is. It's a story of uh, I guess finding birds across Ontario. Um, <clears throat> one question I have for you uh, was um, maybe uh, you know what is your favorite bird. <laughs> My favorite bird. That's an easy answer. Okay. I, I, I've had a favorite bird for quite a while, actually. Uh, my favorite is northern shrike. Uh, so anyone who's not familiar with the northern shrike, uh, they're a songbird about the size of a robin. Uh, they live on Arctic tundra type habitat uh, for the summer, and they come down to our farmland in the wintertime, but they're always in very small number in any uh, certain area. Uh, they're a songbird that has evolved to be a predator. Uh, so they don't have talons like the other birds of prey, but they can still manage to take something as big as like a cardinal, almost the same size as them, or a mouse using only their sharp uh, hook tipped beak. And then they prepare their food as close to humans as uh, probably any animal in the world. They, uh, they hang their food to uh, tenderize in the sun because they can't rip it apart with their talons. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've, I have a new appreciation for the Northern Shrike, so that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, there is one question left here, but I am gonna say that if people do need to leave, um, you're more than welcome to. I just want to um, just, just address this one question last. Um, so what percentage of birds uh, found were located tips from other bird uh, birders advanced sightings? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. Uh, almost every rarity that I saw in my big year uh, would have been found by someone else. Uh, I guess rarity is relative. Um, but anything that's a real significant rarity, like uh, I'd say probably a good portion of the tier four list, which I believe was like 40 or so. Uh, and then a, yeah, more or less all of the tier five birds, which are like the provincial rarities, uh, were found by other birders. Uh, with that said though, uh, to know a location where an uncommon breeder breeds in Ontario and to go there and find it yourself is sort of also found by another birder. Uh, so it gets kind of difficult, right? Even the information uh, found in field guides that we use to find birds at some point in history was put together by other people's sightings too. So uh, yeah, where a, a big day official rules are that you can't have someone really planning things out and like holding things down for you. Uh, and you're supposed to just use your own knowledge to go to the various locations and find all of your birds in a big day, uh, you know, by official standards. Uh, big year official standards don't follow that guideline. It would be impossible to bird without being in communication with other people or if someone's standing next to you spotted something and you're right there can you look at it or not <laughs> yeah <clears throat> no that's a good point like in terms of like about you know using field like we're using field guys it's kind of like this uh built knowledge over time from previous birders <laughs> so um that is that is an interesting point on that side uh, so lots of thanks uh, for presenting tonight and lots of congratulations in the chat here for you uh, and uh, really hope to see you out uh, birding sometime. Um, I think there was somebody here that said that they ran into you a couple of times while you're <laughs> in your big year. So um, yeah, if, and if you're birding at Point Pelee in May, you'll probably see me. <laughs> I'll probably <laughs> either be birding at a kind of fast pace on my own or leading uh, a guiding group or something like that. But I'll, I'll be in or nearby the park. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And no, that... 
Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say thanks uh, to everyone for all the great comments. I'm looking at them too, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, that is great. Um, so just as people are leaving here, if you can just, I'm just going to launch a brief poll. Um, we just want to know about future meetings, if you want them in person, hybrid, which is in person or online, um, or continue with some of our online content as well. So just as you're signing off for the night, pop that into the poll and, uh, and you can leave. <laughs> so.